Okay, well, let, let's get started. I'm Paula Kaufman, and I am the moderator for today's program. And the first thing that I want to do is ask you to please mute yourself. Um, you can unmute yourself if you have a question to ask, but that won't come until after we've heard from our three panelists. Um, this is the first in this year's uh, monthly series called Keeping It Local. And um, this one is, as you know, because you're here, the changing role of libraries in preserving democracy. Public libraries in the United States have a long and rich history. Since the first one was established in 1833 in New Hampshire, the growth of public libraries was fueled by a number of factors, including the belief that an educated citizenry was essential to a democracy to function effectively. And public libraries were seen as a way to provide all citizens with access to information and knowledge, regardless of their financial means. Now, I think we all would agree that public libraries look a little different today than they did in the 19th century, but their mission continues to be to ensure equitable access to freedom and an open and welcoming gathering place. The Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, calls this democracy in action. We have a rich history of libraries in Illinois. Libraries are supported actively by the Illinois State Library and librarians have a long tradition of collaborating to bring content and services to their constituency. This evening, we're in for a treat. We're going to hear from the directors of three local public libraries who will tell us how public libraries continue to preserve and advance democracy. Each one will talk for about 10 minutes, and um, I know that's not nearly long enough for them to cover their topics, and at least two of them have prepared their remarks so that we can leave plenty of time for uh, your questions. Um, the questions will come after all three of them have, have talked. Um, feel free to put questions in the chat as they occur to you uh, as our speakers are speaking. Um, and. Um, I will tell you that our speakers have collaborated as good colleagues to prepare tonight's program. So each is going to focus on a major topic. I'm now honored to introduce these three local leaders and I'm going to tell you who they are and not much else about them in the order in which they're going to speak. Um, first, we'll hear from John Howard, director of the Muhammad Public Library. Um, he'll be followed by Brittany Millington, director of the Champaign Public Library, and then Celeste Choate, the executive director of the Urbana Free Library, who will complete the, the presentations. So John, we'll start with you. Uh, thanks so much, Paula, and thanks for inviting us to be here. We librarians love to talk about our libraries, <laughs> and we love to talk about why libraries exist and how we are you know, carrying forth our mission today. So uh, in terms of our subject for today, uh, I think one of the one of the obvious ways that uh, libraries support democracy is in providing the resources that allow voters to be as informed as possible about the community and about the issues that guide their voting. Obviously, as you said just a minute ago, this starts with the fact that library resources are free to use for anyone, meaning that the right to be informed to be informed is not limited just to those who can afford to pay. And that is, I, I guarantee you, the three of us here all feel that everything, we everything that we can possibly make for free is the way we do things. Now for local elections, especially, we can also be a non-biased source of information for voters. You know that there's been studies done recently that, that talk about people's confidence in the various and types of government and the one that has the highest trust level of course across all types of government is the public library and i think we work really hard to maintain that by holding ourselves to really high ethical standards um, so uh, in muhammad recently we had a very hotly contested school board election a lot of things being said in the community a lot of things being said on facebook which is of course the last place you want to go for good information um, and so the Muhammad Library hosted a moderated panel for the candidates to the school board elections so that people could come and ask their own questions and hear right from the horse's mouth what the people believed in. We're always seeking new ways to get our local elected officials to the library or to find ways to connect people with our local elected officials. 
Um, I think we sometimes forget as citizens that we can talk directly to the people that we um, that we elect, especially at the local level. Um, so that's something we try to can, uh, foster those kind of connections. Now, we can't do this for all candidates in an election, especially in a smaller community. But that is where we are happy to have the League of Women Voters on our side. Um, I'm not going to exaggerate when I say that when library patrons came in during the last election cycle saying, where can I learn more about the candidates and what they stand for? The first thing we offered them was the voter's guide from the League of Women Voters. It was such a great resource for us. And thank you, thank you to whoever did the hard work to put that together and to follow up with all those people hurting cats, I'm sure getting uh, local political candidates to, uh, to fill out a form for you. But it was invaluable. And I can tell you that even at my small library, we recommended it dozens, if not hundreds of times to people who are looking for that information. Of course, elections are not just about candidates in a democracy. They're also very much about issues. We work very hard as libraries, especially on controversial issues, to purchase books and other materials to help people learn for themselves. That, that I think you called it an educated populace is what we're shooting for. Um, and so we try to make sure that we have the materials that if somebody wants to dig into, whether it be climate change or abortion or gun control or any controversial issue, we want to make sure that we have materials that they can get in and really be challenged to learn more about it. One pre key principle that guides us in this is the principle of balance. We make sure we are presenting as much as possible materials that reflect all different sides of an issue. There is a saying in libraries that a library should have something in it to offend everyone. Of course, it is true that as librarians, we have our own strongly held personal beliefs. But when we're buying materials, it is important that we not only buy materials that we personally agree with. My rule of thumb for purchasing books at a library is if every now and then you don't have to hold your nose while you're purchasing a book, you're probably doing it wrong. And the variety in our collections are not just about ideas. We try to make sure we offer materials that reflect the lived experiences, the identities, and the backgrounds of the very diverse communities that we represent. Research has shown that people who read fiction, and I'm sure that's most of the people in this room, people who read fiction, especially those who read fiction by and about people who are different from themselves, exhibit more empathy in other areas of their lives. I think we can all agree that our society can do with a little bit more empathy. And this is what makes it so frustrating when certain persons in our community want to ban or remove books from the library because it contains ideas or content that they disagree with. We believe in freedom. The freedom to choose for yourself what you read, what your child reads or does not read. If you don't agree with it, don't check it out. It's not any more complicated than that. But don't tell somebody else what they can choose to read or not read. This devotion to free speech in the First Amendment impacts not just the books we buy. Our policy at Muhammad, and I'm sure Brittany and Celeste have something very similar, is that if a local group signs up to use our meeting room, we don't leg legislate what they can or can't talk about in the room. That's not our job, as long as they're not impacting other patrons. Freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, we support both of them at the library. And then we provide a place where those things can happen. Okay, I have no idea if that was two minutes or 20, uh, but that's enough for me. Brittany, what's the good word from Champagne? Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to share a bit more about uh, specifically library access and how access at libraries promotes our democracy. Um, but just to start off, I want to share um, this really great quote from the American Library Association that I just love. Um, Democracies need libraries. If a free society is to survive, it must ensure the preservation of its records and provide for free um, open access to this information to all its citizens. It must ensure that citizens have the resources to develop the information literacy skills necessary to participate in the democratic process. It must also allow unfettered dialogue and guarantee freedom of expression. 
So access is really one of those core library values. And when people think of libraries and accessing information, you know, historically they might think about how you can check out books for free uh, with your library card. And of course, that's still very true today. Um, and as John mentioned, that's not something to be taken for granted. Um, but moving past that kind of long-standing example, um, I want to highlight how library access expanded in like the 1990s and early 2000s with that access to technology. Um, and that was a more extreme example of how libraries positioned themselves to adjust right alongside citizens to meet the demands of the rapidly changing world. So as we all know, the technology boom wasn't about just the ease of going online and being on social media. It very quickly evolved the educational, social, and economic landscapes, which are those foundations um, upon which many citizens derive their livelihoods, their empowerment, and their pursuit of happiness. So the rapid rate of the technological advancement required a significant portion of the population to develop brand new technology skills to accomplish many of the things that they needed to do to be informed and to live their lives. So very quickly, citizens had to change um, you know, how they applied for really important things like schools and jobs and benefits. And much of that needed to be done at their public library with access to the internet and a computer. And it was during that time that many libraries developed technology classes to teach citizens how to use a mouse and keyboard or how to set up an email. And now, of course, you know, many of us have uh, devices in our homes or carry them around in our pockets. And even with the access to devices, you know, libraries uh, and many libraries circulate devices, um, information does continue to receive requests for vetted information. Uh, for example, when the pandemic hit, libraries were inundated with requests for how to utilize Zoom. Even those who are adept at technology reach out to libraries for curated content and vetted content, because as we know, one of the amazing things about the internet is how much information is available and how quickly it can become overwhelming. So this is an area where I think libraries will really continue their work, especially as technology continues to significantly change our lifestyles every few years. Um, and more and more, libraries are not just providing uh, resources for citizens to develop or advance their reading literacy skills, but also many other types of literacy, including, of course, the ever-changing technology literacy, uh, financial literacy, business literacy, and in the you know, post-pandemic world, social literacy skills. So access is no longer just about those tangible items within the library, but also includes the educational opportunities and learning and social experiences available through the programs, workshops, and services. And I think it's here that libraries will really continue to flourish because it's pretty amazing to think that right now at local libraries, citizens can engage and connect for free while attending story times with their children. Uh, teens can develop new hobbies and skills and after school activities. Adults can learn how to build a resume or learn how to successfully start and grow a business. And additionally, they can learn all the technology skills and equipment they might need along the way. And all of this with uh, these resources are provided with vetted information and expert guidance. So this kind of access is pretty remarkable and it's really just the surface of what is available to citizens at the library. And then just to switch gears a little bit and talking about uh, challenges or barriers to library access, you know, I think that libraries have done a really nice job uh, trying to eliminate as many barriers as possible. Uh, so for example, many libraries are actively uh, working to expand library card access by issuing library cards to school children or through the Cards for Kids Act to try to ensure that all children um, have access to a local public library. Um, in many communities, customers don't even need a library card to read materials in the building. Um, to use a computer, attend a program or a workshop, or to receive assistance with services. And then, of course, you know, late fines were identified as a barrier, and many libraries throughout the nation have eliminated those in an effort to ensure that citizens can use the library regardless of their financial ability. Um, there are some challenges out there still facing libraries that the profession is working to address. Uh, more and more libraries are being seen as competitors to individual sales from publishing houses and production companies. And this is distracting some companies from wanting to make their content available to libraries for circulation. And this impact includes uh, things like unreasonable ebook pricing, uh, publishing uh, release delays, and the lack of access to streaming content that is now available on streaming networks. Um, but in conclusion, you know, even with those challenges facing libraries, uh, we'll continue to adjust and grow and expand and meet the needs of the community and continue the role of providing access. 
Um, and I do want to share another great quote just to finish out from the late President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, I have an unshaken conviction that democracy can never be undermined if we maintain our library resources and a national intelligence capable of utilizing them. And so now off to Celeste. Can I just say we are such librarians because I also have a quote about libraries that is from Franklin D. Roosevelt. <laughs> When you search for articles on public libraries and democracy, there are these quotes that are going to just keep popping up. So at least we have picked different quotes by these people, which is great. So in an article that was written by Rutgers from the University Library, so got to give our shout out to University Libraries and the important role they play as well. Um, libraries are essential to the functioning of a democratic society. Libraries are the great symbols of the freedom of the mind. And so I'm going to start um, my part of the conversation talking about the very tangible, literal way that libraries help their communities take part in the actual democratic voting process. So you might have heard of organizations that work to help people get registered to vote. Maybe you've heard of such groups, um, the League of Women Voters, perhaps, um, When We All Vote which has been popular with high school students, um, get out the vote. There's organizations all across the country and libraries are a great place to partner, to set up your tables and to help encourage people to vote or register to vote either with you or to go home and register to vote. So that is one thing that libraries do to make sure that people who are able to vote actually are capable of voting in the communities in which they live. Because some communities across the country and maybe now more than in the past, or maybe now going back to what the past was like, um, some communities are putting up barriers to people having the ability to vote. And so libraries can at least work with those who can. Libraries partner with their county clerks or other bodies that are responsible for making sure that votes happen um, in a number of ways. Library staff frequently are the people who come in early to greet the election judges. Um, they're there with smiles and coffee, they're there throughout the day to check in and see how things are going. But 545 comes early for people. And I know I'm always appreciative of my colleagues who are there early to make sure that we are ready as the Urbana Free Library is one of a, the, a polling station. And I know that Muhammad and Champaign Public Library are as well. Libraries across the country are, and that's very important. Libraries also are vote by mail drop-off sites. So when clerk Aaron Ammons was looking for places that people came regularly in the communities, public libraries were one of the categories of places that the clerk's office looked at to partner with because he knows um, that, that we are places that are trusted in the community. And as John said, it are, are trusted public government bodies. And so are all three of us places where you can drop off your mail and vote? Yeah, I thought so. So um, that is one way that we help. Also, some libraries are early voting sites. So for example, at the Urbana Free Library, we're going to stop programming and using the auditorium as a public program space for a period of time before the election, not just the election day, to make sure that people have the option for early voting, not just at the county building, but in spots throughout the community. And what I love as a, as a voter in our community is that I get to vote at work now because the early voting sites are for anyone in the voting area, not just if it's your voting site. And I think that working with our clerks in these ways makes it so much easier for people to be able to just say, oh, I can vote now, today, early, great. And we saw it time after time. And so staff get all on board and helping people know that early voting is happening and that they can participate. And if people aren't registered and still within a window of time, getting people registered to vote as well. So that's important. Um, during the pandemic, I don't know if you remember back in 2020, everything shut down in mid-March of 2020, but then there was an election. There was a spring election and buildings were closed. Like everyone was closed that didn't have to be opened. So the Urbana Free Library was closed to the public, but we opened for the election and it took a little bit of finagling and it took again, dedicated staff, dedicated election judges, but it was important to us to make sure that our community had the opportunity to have multiple places to vote because we didn't want to be around each other. Nobody knew what was happening. And I am proud of our staff for stepping up and saying yes. 
this is important to us in our community and we're going to do that. And we are not the only place. Public libraries across the country made sure that voting could happen during this very difficult, tricky, confusing time. So we are impacted as public libraries by voting as well. So for example, the Muhammad Public Library and other district libraries, their boards are voted in by community members. So aside from looking at the, the big governmental picture with the president and such, or even local with your city mayor, um, literally library boards are elected. And so we are impacted by the local process. And it is important that we pay attention to such things and we participate. Um, for city libraries like Champaign and Urbana, the city, um, the city mayor works with the city council to appoint and approve these appointments. And those people, the mayor and the city council members are elected. So democracy directly impacts our work as people. So it's important for us to be aware of that and to be working within our community, looking at it holistically and making sure that things are running smoothly in the democratic way. So we literally help people participate in, in democracy. Um, at a slightly higher level, when we think about um, like the 30,000 foot view, I, I talk a lot with my hands, so I'm gonna just keep doing that thing. Um, the public library is a center for citizens. So as we've mentioned, an informed citizenry is one that can make informed choices. It is up to people to make their own choices to vote how they will vote, but it's important for us to know that people have the education and the background they need. And we've got some questions on the side about media literacy and disinformation. So um, one thing that libraries do across the country is have different types of training classes on how to see which websites are reputable, how to know on Facebook what to look for to see if you can trust the information that's being promoted in different sites. Um, in some communities, they have media literacy in the public schools, either in the classrooms or in the school media centers. So there's a number of different ways that libraries can contribute to media literacy, especially with things like deep fakes and videos you can create that um, you can do a lot now with misinformation, that is for darn sure. And we are part of the solution and it's hard and tricky even for staff sometimes to know, but we do work together. Some libraries offer citizenship classes. So you can't vote if you're not a citizen. And um, the Los Angeles Public Library has an immigrant, sorry, immigrant integration initiative. And it educates people in the city's many immigrant communities about citizenship and it's establishing its libraries as local citizenship information centers. So the project is a partnership among U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, the City of Los Angeles, and the Los Angeles Public Library. And a friend of mine is the director of the Los Angeles Public Library, and he went to the White House with a person who became a citizen through the library's program and, and got to go to the White House and was very moving seeing every time they bring people in as immigrants, every time um, this this process happens, staff are incredibly moved at knowing how hard people have worked to become citizens and that their work as we are public stewards and public servants to know that our work on a daily basis is helping people become citizens is incredibly rewarding and makes our diverse community, um, makes outcomes of elections different as more people are able to vote and participate in that process. Um, in addition, public libraries help people get high school diplomas. So there is a project called Career, sorry, there's a product that libraries pay for that's called Career Online High School. And in Illinois, there are different sections of the state as far as library service is covered. And there's a group called RAILS, Reaching Across Library Service, and uh, Reaching Across Illinois Library, sorry. And it is the top part of the state. And according to their website, more than 20 Illinois public libraries have participated in Career Online High School. And as of March 2023, 161 students in Illinois have earned their high school diplomas through the program. So again, people are more informed if they have their high school diplomas, they're more likely to have success in life and they're able to make different decisions if they have more education than if they don't. Um, libraries regularly, like Brittany was talking about earlier, help people apply for jobs, whether it's teaching them the technology skills to do it themselves. A number of people don't have those skills and need to apply. Most positions take online applications only at this point. At least that's what we are seeing. And so 
when people don't have those mousing skills yet. And you might be surprised how many people still don't know how to use a mouse in 2023. It is library staff who are patiently walking them through how to create an email account, how to do two-factor authentication, how to, again, mouse, how to apply for the jobs. And we regularly have people coming back to tell us that they got that job. Um, some of these people, again, are immigrants. Some of the people are citizens of Urbana since their birth. And um, some people are illiterate. And one thing that public libraries do is help people that have reading or math challenges learn those different skills. So um, libraries in the area participate with Project Read, which is a grant through the state library in partnership with um, Parkland College that ha holds the grant and runs it. And so math and la language literacy are the skills that are taught. And I see Anna Merritt here on the call. And Anna has been volunteering with Project Read for how many years? Quite a few. Let's just leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. And so um, that is, again, another way that that libraries can help people become informed citizens is partnering with other bodies to do work that is not maybe within the scope of libraries themselves, but to be the place and be the partner so that other organizations can help our community members get the skills that they need. Um, we also know that community members don't have some basic resources. So as, as being a library, one thing we do is help connect people with different community service organizations. We are located across, I'm pointing across the street to the um, Cunningham Township office. And so we work with their office to make sure that people get the rent assistance that they need, or if they need to apply for jobs or need to fax something, they need photocopies, they come across to our library and um, print for free. And then the township pays for those things later, because sometimes a couple of dollars makes the difference in printouts that people need to move on with the next stages of their life and um, get the services they need to be able to think about voting or other parts of the democratic process. If you're not eating, you can't do those things as fully as those of us who don't have food insecurity issues. So um, libraries help in all those different ways. Um, last thing I wanna talk about is unbiased access to information. As John was talking about something in the collection to offend everyone, we do help pr protect First Amendment rights in a number of ways. And we have policies, as John mentioned, that um, don't discriminate on the basis of the content. So libraries will have meeting room policies that talk about time and place. And we have public posting policies that talk about time and place, maybe size of flyer but not content of the flyer, how long flyers can be posted, but not again, what's on it so that people have freedom of, they can use their first amendment rights at the library to reach out and have a meeting to talk about X, Y, or Z issue and meet and discuss ideas because having a public dialogue helps our communities move and be together in different ways and people being siloed all the times. So it's not just about reading independently, it's about coming together as a community. And that's another thing that public libraries are good at. And I will leave it at that for now. Well, thank you to all three of you. Um, I, I think you've, you've gotten us started on a good conversation. There are a number of questions in the chat that I will ask on behalf of the people who put them in there. And then I have questions that have, were submitted to me earlier. So. I'll try to mix it up a little bit. Um, the first question, um, Celeste, you you touched on a little bit, and that's about the library's um, activities and interests um, in teaching or helping uh, your users discriminate um, or address needs for me media literacy and um, especially how to separate disinformation and misinformation from facts. So Brittany or John, do you want to add anything to what Celeste had to say? I will tell you it's hard because people have to want to know and be willing to admit that there's disinformation out there. Um, but for those who are interested, we did in 20, it, this is actually really funny. I thought, well, I can provide a really nice resource here and I still will in the chat. Um, in 2020, we recorded a program that was done on Zoom about how to do that very thing. How can you trust what you read um, or hear? 
Um, and I thought, well, I wonder who the speaker for that was. Well, it turns out the speaker for it was Barbara Jones from the League of Women Voters. And I believe at the time, a board member of the Urbana Free Library. <laughs> Uh, but uh, that, uh, you know, we've got, I, I went ahead and put a link that uh, we've got a YouTube video of that presentation that we did for our group or for our people during an election year. Um, it's hard. I, it really, really is hard. We put that in our strategic plan uh, three years ago when we were working on a strategic plan. I put, you know, make the library the source of good, solid information. And then you realize how hard that is. We're in, a, in an age right now where people don't even want to admit that there's facts. There's no such thing as facts. It's only your opinion. So it's tough. Uh, and if Brittany knows the answer, I'd love to hear it. Um, for us, it's also, though, about when, you know, when we're choosing materials, you work very hard to choose materials that are written by people that have some knowledge and some, of you know, you can prove that they have some knowledge and experience in the field and not just necessarily somebody who just wants to talk. So uh, I, I will say it's hard. I wish we were better at it. Brittany, any anything else? I won't. I won't. You know, uh, expand too much on it because I agree with absolutely everything that John and Celeste mentioned. It is very difficult. It requires continuous training for staff as well. Um, again, identifying deep fakes. You know, new information that becomes available. Uh, it's something that we're consistently training on and uh, being thoughtful to. Uh, sometimes it means you know taking that step back and. Um, you know, really evaluating what the customer is asking for, making sure that we're using vetted content and vetted resources because we are still that trusted source of information, and we want to maintain that position. And um, it's just it's it's a never ending battle. It's definitely something that I think, you know, for the foreseeable future, will probably continue to be a goal for all of us in our strategic plans. Thank you. Um, our next question. I'll read. I live in a library desert hole. Consequently, I'm in favor of countywide libraries. Do Champaign, Urbana, and Muhammad libraries have a position on this concept? Could one of you explain what a library desert hole is? In other words, why or how? I mean, let's start with a question. Does everyone in Illinois have access to a library? Everyone in Illinois does not pay taxes for a library. And that is the issue. And the way our state is set up is it's based on local property tax funding. So other states um, tax for library service differently or fund it differently. So there are areas around all of us. Um, there are a number of people across the state. I forget the number, so I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make one up, but it's a big number of people who in our state don't pay for or receive library service. The good news is, I think John mentioned it, um, that in public libraries, you can visit the library and you can attend programs and you can use the internet. The thing you primarily can't do is check out items, which also means the electronic books as well, but um, you can use the library in the building, which is a, a plus. You can also purchase a library card and there are different formulas. It's in the law that we can't, public libraries can't just give library cards because people are paying taxes. And so um, each library board decides if they do want to offer the option for people to be able to purchase cards. And then there are a couple of formulas the boards are allowed to choose from um, in order to determine the cost of the library card. And so it is set up by the state how we are allowed to offer options. But I know the Urbana Free Library does offer options for people to purchase a card if they so choose, which again, in our case, matches um, taxes that taxpayers would be paying on an equivalent home in the city of Urbana. Brittany, I see you nodding. Yes, very similar at Champaign as well. And uh, we also are structured in that customers don't have to have a library card to come in and access the majority of services. It really is about if you would like to take items home. Um, if you don't have a child who is in, you know, uh, unit four, then of course you'd then have the option of purchasing a card, essentially. As far as the concept of countywide libraries, I mean, there's 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 positives and negatives to anything, you know, and, you know, countywide library, um, we're all going to be in the same system. So we maybe not be able to be as responsive to the needs of our specific community if we're in a bigger group but would we like to see the state find a way a funding model that allows everyone in the state to have access to a free library card i think we can agree that we would all like to see that as a goal 
uh, and whether county libraries is the right way to do that or whether there's another mechanism, I don't know. Thanks. Um, we have a question about uh, stress in your jobs, but particularly or specifically related to um, efforts to ban books. Um, we also know that in the last couple of weeks, there have been threats to libraries, and I believe at least one of your libraries received a threat that was deemed a scam. Um, so could, could you talk about um, the stress in your jobs and any efforts to that you've been, or any stress you've been under because people want books banned? Uh, have, yes. have any of you experienced any efforts to, to ban books or other materials from your libraries? I'll start briefly. We have not had any structured efforts to ban anything in our library. So I'm very grateful to the citizens of Muhammad for that. Um, honestly, it was more stressful when people wanted to fight with us about masks during COVID. <laughs> but, you know, we're always, I, I don't know, but I bet, I bet you if you ask Brittany and Celeste, they have done a lot of preparation and spent a lot of time being ready for when those book censorship uh, challenges come our way. So I think we've all put time into preparing for it at least. Brittany? Yeah, I can just share, um, you know, the Champaign Public Library specifically has had uh, for many years a really strong um, material selection process and policy um, that, you know, very specifically outlines how um, a community member um, can, you know, raise their concern, the, pe the path and the steps that they can take to have that concern um, examined or reviewed. And um, we're very explicit in that we don't um, censor content uh, based on someone's opinion about controversial nature of material. So, um, Ultimately, we, we have not experienced any coordinated efforts that I'm aware of, um, so it that's been fantastic, but I do think that that's because we've had a strong policy for such a long time. Uh, we've made recent adjustments to it, um, including that we will only um, uh, evaluate those concerns made by uh, residents of Champaign, and I think that that's important because sometimes you're seeing coordinated efforts in areas that are not necessarily your service area, uh, which I think is an interesting component to the book bans. But ultimately, um, we've not seen that here. In terms of you know uh, broader issues like threats to libraries generally, um, I think one of the things that has really been um, helpful for us as a profession is that we are you know sharing information with each other. So a lot of that comes down to um, sharing information with staff. Uh, making sure that people feel prepared in process and in procedure uh, to be able to address concerns so that everyone feels that they are empowered uh, with how to respond to unfortunate incidents like threats to libraries. And I think that that's made a big difference for us because, you know, we we know we can't control a lot of these things. And yes, they're very unfortunate. And of course, we'd like to see those resolved. But in the meantime, uh, doing all that we can to make sure that staff and customers know that Safety is our priority, and we'll do what we absolutely need to do to make sure that um, we've we've got the process and the procedures in place so everyone feels empowered when one of those scary situations does arise. So I'm so going to speak briefly about a library in Michigan, because we're not just talking about our libraries, we're talking about libraries writ large. So there is a library in Michigan in the city of um, Patmos, P-A-T-M-O-S. And because the library carries some LGBTQ books, like a, a graphic novel called Gender Queer, the books were in the adult graphic novel collection. And um, according to this article, it is a politically conservative community and the library was defunded um, because the library chose not to get rid of the books from their collection. So the library will be closed unless they pass a millage request. This will be the third time the library is going out to try to pass a millage to keep itself open because it is protecting people's um, First Amendment rights and ac having access to different kinds of um, collections. So it's real and it is extremely stressful for people in those situations, but we also have not had those circumstances here in Urbana. It's pretty liberal um, in some places where, where there are um, drag queen story hours, which we have had successfully for a period of years. They're well attended by people who are interested in those events. And for people who are not interested, like John talked about books, 
if you it's, if you don't want the book for your family, don't check it out for your family. And if you don't want to attend certain programs on whatever topic, conservative or liberal, then don't attend them. But libraries offer these. But in places across the country, libraries, library staff, people are losing their jobs, funding. It's it's a hard time to be defending the First Amendment. Um, but it is part of what we do as public servants in libraries. It is important to us to uphold First Amendment rights. But yeah, so not stressful here, but writ large, yes, absolutely. Could one of you explain what the new book banning law is in Illinois, the protection for libraries? Brittany, I'll call on you. Sure. So um, I, I don't claim to be an expert, but um, to the best of my knowledge, um, the law, um, I think, uh, as long as libraries um, adopt either, I want to say it's a policy that was drafted, um, Celeste, you can help me out with this if I'm wrong, but a policy that was drafted that um, indicates that libraries will not ban materials based on, I think, um, ideology, and I think there are a couple of other components um, as long as they do that, they can continue to receive uh, state funding. Um, so, I mean, our library was in compliance, you know, of course, by having our material selection policy. But I think ultimately the goal is to make sure that libraries are not um, put in a position of banning materials. Um, it kind of gives, uh, you know, a little bit of wherewithal that, you know, the, the boards will have to consider if you're banning materials, then you may not receive uh, funding from this, the state, such as like per capita funding, which has a pretty big impact, I think, for most of us. So, and Celeste, please feel free to jump in if I, if I got that a little bit off. No, that sounds pretty. I was just Googling to get the exact, <laughs> the exact parts, but in part, um, adopting the American Library Association's um, Freedom to Read and Library Bill of Rights is, is part of what is in, what can make it legal for libraries who will be penalized if they, uh, if they ban or restrict materials because of partisan or doctrinal disapproval, and they will be ineligible for state funding. And so for our library, that's about $56,000 a year. So that's, a person in benefits, that's a lot of library books or DVDs or whatnot. So state funding is important to libraries. And so this is definitely, um, it helps library boards be strong when community members, or as Brittany mentioned, non-community members rally around a cause to cause change in a community that might not even be theirs. And I think that's another thing libraries are seeing is that outside groups are coming in to stir the pot. So your local community might be just fine with what you're doing, but outside groups are coming in that are paid to cause change and to swing elections. Um, a number of libraries don't get their millages passed because out group, outside groups come in and don't want, they don't want libraries to expand or build or, or what have you. So it's trying times. Yeah. And I, I will comment a little bit on that. It's not limited to public libraries. Uh, when I was the dean of the libraries at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, we had a group from Chattanooga who came in um, and uh, took books off the shelf. I mean, they borrowed the books and never returned them in order to keep them from being used. So uh, the, the trying times are not new to us. They're just, they seem to be accelerated or deepening these days. Um, Can I put in a plug for another event that's happening with um, Banned Books Week? Uh, the sure. ACLU is having a program this weekend. Which, Thank you. Um, I, was I was going right, to put you a do plug it. in for that at the, at the end. Well, we'll save it for the end. Um, we have a question with a, a sort of different twist to it. Public libraries across the country are beginning to hire social workers or social service staff to help connect patrons with appropriate resources and take the burden off traditional library staff. Is that something that any of you are considering? So we actually had a group of students from the U of I who did a, a semester long study with us to try to look at what some options might be possible. Uh, you know, I think all of us see, uh, and, uh, and usually in the bigger cities, you see it more often, people who come in with just a variety of needs that are, um, and, and, you know, we want people to come to the library when they need the answer to a question. But if the answer to the question is, you know, if the, if the question is, I don't have any food, the answer is, you, you know, we're not going to be able to give them food. We don't check out food. <laughs> and so, you know, I think 
we we look pretty hard into this. We met with a social worker who's on our friends at the library board, um, and we're still pursuing a variety of different possibilities with that. Um, uh, so uh, the need is not as strong in my community. It's just a more affluent community, so we don't see it as often. Um, but I think um, because uh, what we did do, that student group created for us a very strong um, guide to literally all of the resources that they could find um, in the Champaign-Urbana uh, metro area. And so at the very least, we have the question to where do I go for help? We have a good resource for answering that question now. Thanks. Uh, Brittany or Celeste? Yeah, I can just add in, we also operate more on a referral basis. And um, I think a big part of that is making sure that we're in regular contact with our, our community partners. And that's worked out pretty nicely, as John mentioned. You know, we are, we are trained librarians. There are definitely folks out there who are better equipped in a myriad of ways to handle some of these challenges. And so it's been pretty fantastic that we're able to um, be in touch very regularly, um, make sure that we have up-to-date resources of where we're um, educating customers to go, whether they're meeting here at the library to, you know, to start their initial transactions and things like that, that might be one thing. Uh, we certainly do see, you know, different types of behaviors that might be indicative of the need of social um, services. And again, you know, we try to have those conversations with customers or community members when we need to and, and do our best to make sure that uh, we're staying in contact with, uh, with the individuals at service agencies to see how you know the the partnership is working and going both ways but that's actually been pretty successful for us here um you know not to say that it's not successful for other libraries who do employ social workers but um our method and model has seemed to work okay well i have a question that was submitted before the program started what are the biggest changes in how your library is used by families, especially by children and teens, in the past few years? And how important is your library as a third place, a place that ranks only behind home and workplace to your customers? I think Brittany should go first. <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't want to jump right in, but yes, um, so. I think one of the things that's pretty unique about the Champaign Public Library is that in part due to the proximity of the uh, middle school right next door, um, every day after school, we see almost uh, 200 teens who want to spend a couple of hours after school at the library, which I just want to emphasize how absolutely phenomenal that is. At a lot of libraries, the question is, gosh, how do we get teens in the building? And we're very fortunate that we don't see that challenge um, what we get to do with the teens every day after school is engage them in hobbies and activities that we hope will one day be uh, a continued hobby for them or might spark an interest or say, hey, I might want to go into a career to do X, Y, or Z. And I think for us, it's it's pretty inspirational to, to see what our staff are able to provide to the teens after school with this kind of structured programming. And it's been, uh, it's been a phenomenal process and it really does function as that kind of third place for a lot of students um, after, you know, home and school, it's the library after school. And, you know, we, we try our best to make sure that they stay engaged and it's really, it's really an exciting time and it's kind of lending to the opening of our studio, which is our new lower level on uh, here at the main branch. Uh, where we've carved out 8,000 square feet to host those teens after school and, uh, of course, make it available to adults on the weekends. But um, I think it's been it's been very exciting and not just with teens. I would also say with young uh, children and families, we are the third place for a lot of those folks, too, because we're one of the very few places and this is libraries in general. Um, where you can spend time as a family at story time or in a play area and you don't have to spend money. You know, parents don't have to buy a coffee or continue to buy a coffee or treats and things like that to be able to spend time there. Um, you know, many families, especially if they're new to the area, utilize the library as the first place of contact to try to build relationships and friends. And so I think that for many of us, this is, you know, a pretty common occurrence on a day to day basis. Could, Brittany, could you give us an idea as to what's going to be in the studio? 8,000 square feet sounds like a lot of space. It sure and is. I, it's so exciting. If I volunteer <laughs> at the friend shop, I'll put in a plug. It's right next door. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
So I've, the, um, I've, I've, I've had to peek around the barriers to see what's going on there, but it looks like it's going to be a pretty phenomenal place. Oh, absolutely. On October 7th, we would invite everybody to come over and take a look. Um, so the studio is, um, uh, like, like you mentioned, 8,000 square feet on the lower level that includes uh, Macs and PCs. It includes gaming. Um, so the interesting thing about gaming is, you know, yes, it's a lot of fun. It's entertaining. It can be educational. Uh, there are a lot of colleges and universities that are adding gaming and software development and design. So it's one of those things where it might seem like a lot of fun, but you're also kind of learning in the process. Uh, virtual reality will be included down there. Um, we have a performance and flex space that will kind of switch out from time to time. It can be used for poetry readings. It can be used for foosball or air hockey. Uh, we'll have a maker area available, um, which will include um, low forge equipment, crickets, sewing machines, um, just some really cool uh, kind of crafting type uh, area. And then we also have um, two sound booths. Uh, so uh, people will be able to you know, record their podcasts at the library or edit videos um, and a green screen so that the teens can record their TikTok there. I think you'll have more than 200 students a day down there. So what kind of security challenges, though, does having so many teens in your library or just in general, the security issues that all of you face? Brittany, let's start with you since you're up on the screen. Sure. You have an 8,000 uh, square foot studio. Uh, <laughs> jealous, jealous. Uh, so in terms of security at the library, and I think I saw, you know, a, a question relevant to that in the chat, um, you know, I think we all kind of operate with the rules of conduct so that all customers have access to and can enjoy the library as a space. And we hold those same expectations when the teams come over. That means we dedicate, you know, some staffing to making sure that you know, the teens who are coming to the library are able to use the space in a way that is conducive to others being in the space too. Sometimes that's a little bit too much uh, freedom for a kiddo and that's okay. We can have a conversation with a parent and develop a plan to make sure that they can be at the library um, in a way that works. Um, so I think that in addition to um, just regular constituency utilizing the library, you know, most of us have our staff trained in how to address behaviors, you know, whether it's something along the lines of sleeping at the library or being too loud at the library. Um, sometimes, you know, you're even seeing it's not quite security, but you're seeing librarians or library staff trained on, you know, um, issuing Narcan, those types of things, those kinds of, you know, more like medical challenges or things that sort of arise as emergency. So um, I think, you know, by this point, many of us in the library profession are, you know, are, are pretty attuned to being able to address security matters. Great. Uh, John or Celeste, do you want to add anything to that? It's a lot of people coming in. We get, um, let's say, 30 to 50 teens a day before the pandemic, and so not 200. But it's just a lot of people if they all come in at once. And so part of it is having expectations that are realistic about sometimes a day in some places will be louder than others. So we've zoned our library. So the second floor where the reference is in the nonfiction collection and the archives, that's a quieter zone. Whereas on the main floor where we used to have a cafe, um, that was a louder zone or the children's area is by default going to be a louder zone because we encourage people to have to read aloud and sit on the furniture with their kids and read and have a good time and play with the interactive toys because we know talking, reading, uh, talking and reading, reading and singing, those are part of um, literacy learning elements that that we have with kids. So partly being realistic about what is capable of happening in a particular space and then being consistent, like Brittany said, with the rules of behavior has helped everyone know what to expect. So some places will be quiet and some places are not going to be quiet just because of the nature of the work that's happening there. Mm -hmm. And that that has helped. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Um, and that is, what questions would you like to see voters address to candidates? Questions about the role of public libraries and the issues that you've discussed this evening. You know, I think uh, you know, it's a good start, start with the uh, legislator and their governor supporting, you know, trying to protect the library from the book banning that we see in other places. Um, we always would like to see more state funding. I think the question earlier, um, you know, that related to the 60% of the land in Illinois that does not have library service 
attached to it is something that's a great question for our state politicians. Um, and a third thing, we haven't, somebody referenced it just very briefly. Um, no one's really been totally successful with this, but some states have begun to work on some uh, laws regarding publishers that are being, I would say, predatory in terms of what they charge for electronic books for libraries. Um, and I know this that our state does have some legislation in a pipeline on that. Um, you know, we don't want the publishers to give us books for free. We know they need to earn some money, but to charge $65 per copy for an electronic version that costs them $0.00 to produce uh, for an additional copy is, is really taking advantage of the public libraries. And like all these kind of things, who are the people who primarily get their books from the public library? They're the people who have less resources. They're the people who are more likely to be poor. You know, the rich can go on... Uh, can go on Audible and get all the audiobooks they want, or they can go to Amazon and download them for their Kindle. But the poor, you know, really get what they need from the library. And the publishers are making it extremely hard for libraries to provide electronic content. Um, and it's something that I don't think it's, it's going to change unless our, governor, our governing people uh, kind of put themselves into the, the equation. Brittany, anything to add? No, I mean, I do, I do agree with John, especially about the, um, you know, always encouraging the being thoughtful to, you know, library funding and things like that. You know, we don't necessarily want to encourage, um, you know, uh, property tax caps, those types of things that potentially impact libraries and their uh, primary revenue sources. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting about libraries is, you know, in terms of library budgets, most of the time you have kind of a two-prong approach. You have materials, which are the, the books and the materials, as John mentioned, are getting more and more expensive. And then you have the staffing, the folks who provide those resources and services who are teaching, you know, classes about technology and, and developing a business and uh, getting a job, all of those types of things um, take really, you know, well-trained, strong staff. And so when you're looking at libraries and their two primary uh, expenses being materials and personnel, we really do want to make sure that, that, um, that our revenue sources are secure. Great. Celeste, last word. I think that funding is really important, actually, um, as Brittany was saying, because there are a number of unfunded mandates that come through the state that impact libraries. So we all want to pay our staff more because they are fabulous and wonderful, and the staff are the most important part of a library. And there are different laws that come through that impact how the library has to run, whether it's new HR laws or other things, and it impacts how we are able to pay staff, um, given the other unfunded mandates that are that are coming down. So it may be the minimum wage change, which of course then raised um, the amount of money that people who are paid less are being paid, which is great. But for some libraries, um, especially downstate where they have smaller communities, there are library directors that weren't making minimum wage. So it, and they should be, and they should be paid a higher minimum wage, but some libraries are really struggling to, with the small budgets they have, to function given the minimum wage change. There hasn't been a lot of time for those particular institutions to make the switch. So, um, and there are standards that the state sets. So one should be spending uh, up to 12% of your library on materials, uh, your library budget, and then between, I'm gonna say 60 and 65% um, on wages and benefits. And so there's not a lot of play if you're meeting the state standards and these outside, um, uh, factors change how you are able to spend your money and be responsive to your community. And some libraries have $14 million budgets up in Chicago. And again, some libraries downstate are barely paying their directors minimum wage. So it's complicated, um, but more money from the state's always better. <laughs> well, that's a good last word to have. Um, before I thank our three panelists, um, I, I want to follow up on Celeste's reminder that the uh, ACLU of Illinois and Champaign County um, are on Sunday, October 1st, um, holding a program called Beyond the Pages, Defending Your Right to Learn. It runs from 1.30 to 3.30 at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Urbana-Champaign, which is at 309 West Green Street in Urbana. So I hope that many of you will have the opportunity to uh, continue this conversation uh, relating to First Amendment issues 
and um, will be able to join our colleagues at the ACLU on Sunday, October 1st, this Sunday, October 1st. So I hope you will join me in thanking John Howard, Brittany Millington, and Celeste Choate, who gave us a very thoughtful and um, thought-provoking and energetic uh, discussion this evening. So thank you all.